Okay, so we are recording now. Um, so hi everyone, thank you for attending our fourth webinar. Um, I'd like to introduce you all to Jamie Pastana, who is a chiropractor in our area and also a very accomplished dressage rider and trainer. Um, and so without further ado, Jamie, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Megan. Um, thank you guys for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Um, if you guys have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to communicate in the chat box. Um, I don't really care if you want to come off mute and interrupt me too. That's totally fine. But chat box is probably an easy way to shoot me some questions or any comments that you might have. Um, sorry, that should be the last noise interruption there. So um, Megan already introduced me, but um, just a little bit about me. I'm a chiropractor. I graduated from LifeWest Chiropractic College in Hayward in the Bay Area um, last year. And um, I have shown my horse wins a lot through Grand Prix, or formerly my horse, he's on the right here. And I'm um, an assistant trainer at a barn in Pleasanton with my mom. Um, today I'm gonna be talking about biomechanics, rider position, developing a functional core. Um, at the beginning, it's gonna be a little heavy on the talking because I wanna introduce some concepts, but I promise we're gonna get into more movement as the lecture goes on. Um, I will say a caveat that I tried to pack a lot of information into a lecture without keeping you guys for hours. So um, I have pre-recorded videos rather than doing it live, which is how I usually do this presentation. And they may be a little fast for following along. So if you guys think it would be helpful, um, I can put together all the videos I did or maybe extend them out into more of like a follow along workout style video that I can post in the next few days. So. If, that's, if you guys enjoy this and you wanna be able to follow along a little bit easier, just let me know, I can totally do that. Um, okay, so I wanna start with some examples of some very nice rider position. I focused on the US riders here, that would be nice. Um, so these are obviously five different riders with very different body types. And my point of the lecture today is not to like nitpick apart every little minor bit of position. Um, there was a rider biomechanics seminar weeks ago that you guys probably heard by Alexis Martin by Veg, sorry. Um, it was really awesome. If you guys haven't heard that, you definitely should. Um, and that one really got into some of the details of position. Um, but one thing I do really want to point out about all of these different riders, even though they have totally different body types, if you guys have met Adrian and Debbie who are back to back here, uh, Debbie is less than five foot, Adrian is over six foot, completely different body types, but um, very, both very balance all of these riders look like if you took their horse away from them that they could be standing on their own and so that's really a testament to a very functionally strong core which is what I'm going to be talking about today um, I know some most of us are sounds like probably still able to ride right now which is awesome but for those who aren't these are some things that maybe you can be doing at home while you're not able to ride so that when you can get back on your horse you're in better control of your body for your own biomechanics and to ride even better so even though I'm not going to nitpick on different positions right now, it'd be kind of hard to have a rider biomechanic um, <laughs> talk here without at least mentioning some common faulty postures that I see both as a trainer and a chiropractor. Um, today the focus is going to be on movement rather than analyzing positions, so I'm not going to go too much into it. But I will say that these images that look like this I got from a book called The Riding Doctor. Um, which I will mention at the end, I have some um, recommended books that are really awesome. So. Um, and that book really gets into each of these different postures and why they make for ineffective riding and all kinds of other stuff. So um, definitely wanted to mention that. Of course, on the left here, we see a neutral posture and then some different um, sort of faulty postures that we get into. Okay, so um, this is the reality in 2020. This is what we're looking at in an ideal world, I would not have to talk about human biomechanics because we would just be out there doing it with great posture and doing all the right movements for having a super stable core. But the reality is that a lot of people are working a desk job all day. Even those of us who are lucky enough to be at the barn all day riding horses, we are still driving to get there. We're looking at cell phones. We get home, we sit on the couch at night. And so we're seeing a lot of postures that are due to the fact that our bodies are not moving how they were really designed to move. Um, nothing about the human body was designed to get in a car crash, to even really sit on a horse. That's not something that, uh, that is naturally developed in the human physiology. 
safety. And so we have to do some things to counteract that. We've got some added challenges that our, our ancestors did not necessarily have on a horse or not. So um, some of the stuff that we're gonna be talking at the beginning here are really due to the fact that we live in 2020 and we have some of these added challenges. Um, so I wanna introduce a concept here before we get into some of the more um, nitty gritty of biomechanics. So reciprocal, sorry, reciprocal inhibition is a neurological process where muscles on one side of a joint relax so that the other side can contract. So every single joint in the body, in this picture here, we're looking at an elbow, has two muscles, one that, that they oppose each other. So one's gonna flex it, the other one's gonna extend it. So when one muscle is acting to move a joint, such as in this photo, we've got a bicep is contracting to bend the elbow the triceps isn't just not working, it's actually being neurologically inhibited. And so, um, so that muscle is basically being turned off by the brain in that moment. Not the, looking at the arm, not such a big deal when we're talking about riding here, but another muscle that gets a lot of, top, it's a hot topic of conversation, and that's for pretty good reason, is the hip flexors or the iliopsoas muscle is actually made up of both the psoas and the iliacus muscle and they come together they connect the iliacus connects to the back of the rim of the pelvis i don't know if you guys can see my mouse here i'm using it as a pointer i'm not sure if you can see that but um the iliacus, yeah we can see the mouse you can okay cool <laughs> so the iliacus is on the back of the pelvis and the psoas muscle connects to the back of the vertebra of the spine and so when you sit down even if you're sitting with perfect posture the hips are flexed which is of course shortening the hip flexors um, now the muscles that oppose the hip flexors are your hip extensors, which is going to be your gluteal muscles. So when you're sitting all day, not only are you not using your glutes and you're shortening those psoas muscles, but you're actually neurologically inhibiting your glute muscles. And so if you guys have ever heard the term, use it or lose it, this is not only in regards to really working out a muscle, but also neurological pathways. So I'm sure you guys have all heard the term muscle memory before, and that's you know, sort of a colloquial term, but there is something to that in that the neurological pathways that we use most frequently are the ones that are constantly being reinforced. And so if you're sitting at a desk for, I don't know, eight hours a day, then you go home and sit on the couch, for that many hours of the day, you are you're not using those neurological pathways that would activate the muscles that oppose that hip flexor. So you end up with something that kind of looks like this. You go to stand up, your leg is forced to be straight down, but that psoas muscle is shortened, connecting to the back of the vertebra, and you get this extra curve in the low back. The hip extensors are turned off, so the glutes are not working properly. And so added together with the fact that now you've got a weak glute, a tight hip flexor, which is tipping the pelvis forward, now your upper body, so that you're not falling on your face, is gonna have to come way back here. So you get an extra curve in your, it's called thoracic spine, the upper back, which is gonna turn off your abdominal muscles because you've got this extra arch going on, it's really stretching the abdominal muscles, and you've got tight muscles in the low back there. The erector spinae muscles are the ones that go, well, I'll go back a slide here, it's gonna end up with these muscles that run along the back of the vertebra extra tight. And so you get, it's called a lower cross posture, where you've got the, the extra curve in the low back. Then it also is affecting the upper body here. So we've got the neck jutting forward to counteract the fact that the thoracic spine is way to the back. So that was a lot of information on that. <laughs> um, but this is, you know, some of the stuff that as a chiropractor, you know, I see this all the time, not just in riders, this is in normal people. But when you look at the picture on the right, you end up with maybe a faulty position like this when you get on the horse. Now, again, I'm not going to get into each and every single posture here, but I promise that everything I talk about today is going to be beneficial no matter what posture you have on the horse or whatever posture you tend towards, I should say. I know, for example, I tend towards having a really arched low back, so that's something I have to think about quite a lot when I ride. Um, so the, we talked about the glute max, the, uh, the gluteus maximus. That's the main glute muscle, your big butt muscle. Uh, there are two other muscles that also assist in, um, in glute extension or in, um, in hip extension, two smaller gluteus medius and gluteus minimus muscles that attach more to the side of the hip here. And they are also responsible for what's called abducting the leg, so pulling the leg away from midline, as well as stabilizing the pelvis. And so 
as a writer, we generally think, oh, you know, most of the muscles are the adductors, which are the ones that are pulling legs in towards the midline. These are what I like to call the don't fall off the horse muscles. Um, it's kind of ridiculous how strong our adductors are as riders. I've gone to the gym and literally had guys gather around when I do that exercise because they're struggling with it, you know, where you push your legs in towards the middle. They're over there struggling. And I'm like, yeah, sure, I can max out the machine. Now put on the abductor, different story. Um, so, you know, you think as a rider, well, who cares? You know, I want to be able to stay on the horse. I want to have these strong adductors. Well, what happens to a joint when it's not moving? What do the opposing muscles do? They stabilize the joint. So if you guys would like to follow along here and get a little bit of movement in, if you stand up right now, legs uh, around shoulder width apart and put one hand on each of your glutes on the side and then lift one leg off the ground. So you're just balancing on one foot and feel the activation of the side of your glutes, these gluteus medius minimus and maximus to balance yourself on that one side. You're not actually pulling your leg away from the body, but you're stabilizing your pelvis and your body. And so, as riders, we have these super strong adductors. It's a really unusual thing in athletes. I've had chiropractors and physical therapists tell me nobody has tight adductors. Nobody has overly strong adductors. I'm like, I want to bet you haven't worked with riders. Um, so these muscles, again, with their cervical inhibition, they get really tight and they also contribute to turning off these muscles that really should be stabilizing our pelvis all the time. So you look at something like a half pass from behind and you think about how much pelvic stability you need to have in order, let's see, the rider is turning their body in the direction of the half pass, the inside leg is on, the outside leg is back, and you wanna stay centered while the horse moves in the direction of travel. There's a lot of stability happening there. So if you don't have those muscles turned on on the side that stabilize the pelvis, it can really, even though we're talking about you know, leg and glute muscles, this really contributes to the core as a whole. So then I wanna add on talking something about <laughs> our boots that we're wearing all day. It might seem like not that big of a thing, but I don't know about you guys, I'm really guilty about sticking my tall boots on when I get to the barn. I do turnouts in them, I tack horses up in them, I'm in them for 10 plus hours a day. Then I get home and I put on my slippers. Um, recently, I have started having a lot of foot and low back pain, and so I started doing some research into what shoes I'm wearing all day. And I made me realize, okay, I'm sitting here in a heeled boot all day long. Now, of course, it's not as high as a high heel. Looking on the left here, we're looking at a, you know, a true high heel here. But for every single degree of a heel that we're wearing on our shoe, that your body has to compensate that amount of angle in your knees, hips, and low back. And so I did a little measurement here. So it's just a regular dress cavallo boot. It's uh, about a 10, 10 degree angle there. So that's 10 degrees of uh, excuse me, of extension that your low back and knees and hips are going to have to compensate for so that you're not falling on your face when you're walking around. And then add to that the fact that a boot is, has a pointed toe, it's squeezing your foot, it's not flexible on the bottom of it. You're losing out a lot of the benefit of walking around in, um, because a lot of people are walking on unnaturally solid surfaces all the time and unnaturally flat. So sidewalks, uh, the floors in our house, stuff like that. Um, these are not great things anyway. We get a lot of feedback in our body from our feet and the muscles in our feet connect to a lot of other things in the body. So we are at kind of a really cool advantage that being at the barn all the time, we're walking in sand, which is like one of the best things you can do is to walk in sand or walking on dirt or walking on hills, all this stuff. But you add on this shoe that really takes away some of that benefit. And then if you're doing it all day, it can really lead to exaggerating that low back curve that's already kind of an issue from sitting in chairs all the time. And so I really recommend that we're using shoes other than our boots. Even paddock boots have a pretty big heel on them. So I have a couple pictures here. My fiance would tell me that I have the boots on the left here. She thinks they're the ugliest things in the world. But I work with a lot of young horses right now. I like to have a boot that covers my ankle. Um, this is just one particular brand of um, these are zero drop shoes. So drop is the distance between the heel and the toe on the shoe. Um, so these ones are completely flat. Um, they make, there are a bunch of different brands of them now. I happen to like this one. It's called Lens, but, you know, they make different tennis shoe versions if you're comfortable wearing a tennis shoe at the barn. Um, but, I mean, that might be a little, a little hippie for some people to wear the completely flat shoe. So there are other really good options. Really, any tennis shoe is going to be better than walking in your boot all day. Um, you know, the average running shoe has between 10 and 12 millimeters of a drop, which is 
you know, not perfect, but compared to a boot that has 25 to 30 millimeters of a drop, it's still an improvement. Um, pretty good. So we've got the new balance, balance Minimus. I actually have these two. They're pretty cool looking. I actually like these shoes a lot. They have a four millimeter drop. There's a Nike version. There's a waterproof Ariat version that it's not, I don't actually don't know what the drop is, but it looks relatively flat. So general rule of thumb, if you feel like the shoe that you're wearing would be safe in a stirrup, it's probably not great for walking around all day. So consider when you're walking around at the barn, switching out your shoe. Um, that's a pretty easy thing, pretty easy fix that can really actually make a difference in your riding. Okay, so start getting into more core stuff here. So when we look at core workouts, we see a lot of things like crunches, bicycles, um, a lot of stuff that's not necessarily functional movements. You being able to lie on your back and curl your body up, sure, it might flatten out your abs, it might give you a six pack if you're lucky, which is not me, but um, there, it's not really all that functional. When you're sitting on a horse, you don't know how the horse is gonna move at any moment. You're trying to coordinate your limbs and coordinate your core at the same time. And so having a functional core as a rider is a lot more important than being able to do 600 sit-ups. And so the stuff that we're gonna be going over today is if you're looking for the hardest core workout you've ever done, probably not what you're looking for, um, but it is gonna be a lot about how to get your core activated and firing in a way that's really functional. Um, there's a lot of things that the core does other than just flex you into a sit up. It flex, it twists, it bends, it stabilizes the spine. It's a connection between the upper body and the lower body. It moves the legs in relation to the body. There's a lot of functions that are not necessarily getting touched on in day-to-day -day life and or the average core workout. So that is the reference point here. So um, this is a quote kind of taken from a couple different things that I pieced together, but your body adapts to what you do most of the time. So if you have poor mechanics 23 hours of the day and then you do, you exercise for one hour, which for most people would be an amazing thing if you could exercise one hour a day it's not gonna be enough to make significant changes. You're gonna keep tending towards these, um, these you know, patterns that you're sitting in most of the day. And so I'm gonna start by talking about how you sit and how you stand, um, even though that's not necessarily an exercise, it really is applicable to riding and to your core. So I'm gonna get to some movement here. So the very first thing I wanna talk about here is flared ribs. So this is something that we see really often um, in everyone and often in riding. So if you look at the picture on the left here, the riders, yes, has kind of an overarched slow back. We've got, um, you know, based on the picture, the seat bones are pointed backwards. But if you notice the ribs here are also sort of pointed up, up towards the horse's ears. And I think Alexis actually talked about this a bit um, in her presentation on rider biomechanics. Um, but why we see this so often is because if you remember back to the pictures of people sitting at a desk, we are sitting with shoulders rounded, head forward most of the day. I'm gonna play this video and I'll talk along with it of how we're gonna get those ribs back where we want them to be. So we've got the, the shoulders forward, head forward. Now the trainer says shoulders back, head, head back, shoulders back. So you can see as I do that, let me start it over. As I do that, my shoulders come back, my head comes back, but my ribs go straight up. There's no core activation there. Let's see, ribs pointed up. So how are we gonna fix that? We're gonna bring the ribs down and back. It's a good thing to follow along with. You can do it seated or standing. Now I've got a pretty neutral posture there. The abs are engaged, but I'm gonna do it again, flare those ribs and then bring them down and back. So that's engaging the core without the idea of you know sucking your stomach brace your core because a braced core is not necessarily an effective core either just like having your core completely turned off having it turned 100 percent on isn't really all that dynamic if you've ever you know if you're pulling as hard as you can on something and put more weight on it there's not a lot of strength to respond whereas if you're engaged but not at you know full strength of gripping i should say um it can really respond to what it needs to so that's the first concept and it's gonna keep coming back with literally everything today. The main thing I will say is keep your ribs down. So I hope that made sense. So let's see, where's my slide going? There we go. Okay, so now talking about sitting. If you guys are like me, you're probably sitting right now. 
Um, so the same concept is going to apply with those ribs, but we're going to add in a few other components. This is not a nice chair that I'm sitting in. Also, um, my whole thing today was supposed to be about making movement fun, and I'm sorry I look super grumpy in all these pictures. It was like 7.30 in the morning when I was recording these, and apparently I was grumpy. Um, but anyway, so sitting in a chair here. So first, you're going to scoot to the edge of the chair because you want or some saying you have to sit at the edge of your chair at all hours of the day, but it is good every, you know, maybe every 15, 20 minutes, scoot towards the edge, engage your muscles for a little bit, and then go back to relaxing. So first thing is scoot towards the edge, then you're going to rock forward on your pelvis. You don't want that rounded pelvis all the time. You want to think about sitting like you would on your horse with your seat bones straight down. So scoot to the edge and rock forward on those seat bones. Now in the video here. I'm sitting where I should be, but my head is jutted forward. Maybe I was just looking at a computer screen or writing or texting or something. So rather than just thinking about pulling my head back, but not, um, but maybe flaring my ribs or, you know, not using any muscles to do so, just kind of um, putting my head at a place that's not actually going to stay. Um, I'm going to get to the ribs here first, ribs down and back. Now I'm gonna put my chin to my chest, a tuck there. Now using the muscles in the back of my neck or the, the upper back, I'm gonna pull my head up towards level. So rather than just lifting the chin up, I'm gonna really think about activating those muscles. So I'm gonna go back to that part one more time. Enjoy my double chin. So chin down, now really using those upper back muscles to pull the head back as if I'm gonna press my head into the wall behind me rather than just bringing the chin up. Those are gonna use the postural muscles that are gonna actually help to keep my head in the right position. I had to remind myself to keep the ribs down, that's hard for me. Um, and then that's how you really stabilize your spine rather than just um, you know hoping that it's gonna stay in the right position. So that's sitting better. Now, uh, gosh, sorry. There we go. Now standing better. So we've already talked about some of the parts of standing better, those ribs being down, but um, getting into a couple other little things here. So if you find your, uh, your hip bones, which are right on the front, they're not really your hip bones, but it's what most people call them. It's called your ASIS, but the front of your pelvis, those little bony prominences, when you're standing, you want those to be in line with the middle of your ankle. So I did this barefoot so you can really see how my feet respond. Now, once those are in line, I'm going to rotate my um, I'm showing here that my knees are pointed in, my feet are kind of collapsed on the ground here. So I'm gonna rotate my thighs outward so that my knees are pointed forward. So watch what happens, I'm gonna do it a couple times, watch what happens to my feet when my knees come out. It automatically adds an arch to my foot. Now, you know, most people um, are lacking an arch at this point in their life, and that's partly because we're lacking a lot of the muscles that support an arch, which come all the way from the hip. So um, you want to make sure that your toes aren't gripping when you do this, and it does take a lot of practice. But if you have to, if you're standing at a concert or something, that's, you know, you're going to be standing for a while. Sorry, I started the video over. Um, you can really work on maintaining that arch by using the muscles in your leg to create an arch there. And then from there, I'm going to turn sideways in just a second here. Gosh, I look grumpy. I'm sorry. So turn to the side. Now this is my actual hip. So my, um, like the ball and socket joint of the hip. I'm going to find that there. I want that to be in line with the, the bone on the side of my ankle over here. So you can see it was shifted forward. Now I'm going to shift it back. And then of course, I'm going to check in on those ribs again. So ribs going down and back there. Now I'm in a nice neutral posture, safely stand for a longer period of time. Not really, I don't want to be doing anything for a long period of time. Standing for long periods is just as bad as sitting for long periods. So you want to be moving around often, but if you are standing, that is a good way to do it. Okay, so this is um, just so you think I'm not crazy. I'm talking about rider biomechanics and I'm telling you how to sit and stand. Um, this is the exact same concepts that I just said applied to riding. <laughs> don't mind my ghetto blue saddles. This is the only one that I happen to have in my garage. Um, but same things apply here. So my feet are out in front of me. I'm not very balanced. So I'm going to shift so that my hip bones and my ankle bones are in alignment here. But I go shoulders back, those ribs flare, my balance, not so good. I'm going to tip forward if my horse pulls or whatever, my core is not very engaged here. So I'm going to bring those ribs in and back. Now my shoulders relax and I'm in a nice stable position. I can use my hands, I can twist my body. 
and I'm in that nice stable alignment. I'm not gripping, I'm not sucking my stomach in. I'm just bringing those ribs down so that I take the stretch off of the core muscles and can allow my core to activate properly if, if need be or for whatever movement I happen to be doing with my horse. Okay, so now we're gonna get, oh gosh, sorry. Now we're gonna get into more um, actual movement and keeping that core activated while we're doing some movement. So um, in this day and age, your, our shoulders become very stuck down on our ribs because again, we're sitting at computers, we're even riding horses, we're not using our arms all that much. They kind of stay stuck to our ribs, which if your trainer's ever said, use your, use your hands or your arms or your half halt independent from your body. That's kind of tough to do if your shoulders literally are at ease to your ribs. And so these exercises that are coming up are really good ways to start making your arms more independent from your body um, and from your rib cage. And so this first one here, these are called floor angels. So sorry about my disgusting garage floor. That is my home gym. Um, so I'm lying on the ground here. Now I'm going to get my ribs. So right now my ribs are flared. I can stick my entire arm under my core there. So I'm going to bring those ribs down and back. Now uh, I'm just moving my arms there. That's why I'm doing a weird thing. You can see that my ribs are flat on the ground, but my back isn't necessarily. So this isn't to suck my stomach in, take the curve out of my back. This is a flatten my ribs against the ground here. Now, if I can't maintain that, I can take a towel, lift my back up, and put a towel or multiple towels under my upper back to help my ribs stay flat on the ground in that position. Not that I'm not working at all, but that I can maintain it while I'm doing other things. I took it out because I was hoping I was strong enough to do it without. Um, so this is exactly what it sounds like. It's, it's like snow angels, but on the floor, I'm gonna keep those ribs down bringing my arms out to the side and going overhead, only going overhead as much as I can without those ribs flaring there. So I'm demonstrating it only on one side because my left shoulder is um, very unstable. It dislocates really easily, which means I need to be doing more of this stuff, but um, I was using it to demonstrate that my ribs are staying flat. So ideally you do this with both hands. You can do it one at a time though, whatever. Whatever floats your boat really. Um, but again, it doesn't look all that hard, but if you, if you do it, you'll notice that, you know, as that arm gets higher up, it really does become difficult to keep those, those ribs down and back in a position that your core is, you know, it shouldn't feel like your core is burning as you do this, but it just should feel like it's activated. You know, if you, if you poke your core, it should feel solid. Um, so that, you know, that would be equivalent to you being on your horse and trying to use your arm, your you know, half ball aid or whatever. So, um, Progression from this, this is getting a little bit harder here. So this one's called pullovers. Um, I happen to use a five pound weight in this. Um, you can use something lighter. You want something that's essentially about the width of your shoulder blades. So this was maybe even a little narrow. Might I recommend a wine bottle? We are on quarantine here. Um, but same idea here. We're gonna go the ribs down and back, nice and flat on the ground. You're gonna take whatever thing you're using. You can use heavier weight if you want, straight overhead and then um, ideally, you want to get to the point where you can touch the floor. Uh, like I said, my left shoulder is pretty unstable. I didn't want to dislocate it on a video for you guys, so I did not go all the way to the floor, but as far as you can go while keeping those ribs flat. Now, I had, uh, let's see, that one I think was supposed to be demonstrating that my ribs were flaring because that one wasn't so good. Um, I may be going a little too far here. You want to really be able to keep those ribs down and back. It's not terrible, but it's not perfect. <laughs> So anyway, you can record yourself or have a buddy that calls you out. It doesn't help that I have a black shirt on in front of a black car. But um, yeah, I think you guys get the idea there. Okay, so then this one, these are called crescents. This is a really nice stretch, but it's also starting to add in the component of a side to side or a bending. So you can do this against a wall. You can see a little better than before because I'm against a white wall now. Hands overhead. Before doing this, make sure those ribs are flat against the wall. And as you do this, I was actually surprised when I started doing this, um, how hard it is to keep the rib on the opposite side of the bend. So like this rib over here, really anchored down and back and wants to flare. Um, but this is, you know, we want to have a lot of mobility in our upper body riding the horse so that we can turn with the horse. And if you're riding something like a canter pirouette, you have to have pretty good mobility in your upper body. And um, and whatnot. So this is a good one. It really does kind of work those obliques. You can do it on the ground as well. Um, you just keep your feet essentially in one place and bend side to side. But I thought the wall was a little bit more functional maybe. And then um, spinal twists. So 
Um, similar idea to the crescents, except now with a twist. So we're going to sit with our good posture, those ribs down and back, starting with a slight twist where those ribs really stay anchored down. And then this twist starts to get a little bit more and a little more. And then you get to the point where you maybe hook your arm over the back of it and you hold it for 30 seconds, a minute. A minute is probably ideal. Um, they've actually done, done studies that the best stretch is about 90 seconds, which really seems like a long time to hold a stretch, but um, it is, you know, it is the best way to get those muscles to relax. So I demonstrated a paddle as well, because if you have a well-behaved horse, maybe this is something that you do as part of your warm-up. You, you know, warm your horse up, warm yourself up when you're on the horse. You make sure that you can twist both ways, keep that core activated. Um, you may find that you have a direction it's harder to twist. For me, it's to the right. I always like to twist left while I'm riding. Um, and so, you know, this can help you pinpoint some of those areas that, hey, this side's harder. Maybe I need to spend 30 more seconds stretching this way, um, but making sure to keep those ribs down. There we go. Okay, rib slide on a wall. This is all just, you know, very dynamic mobility and being able to keep the core active. So I know this is probably kind of boring. You might've been hoping for some really exciting core stuff. We'll get there. Um, but this one I'm not so good at. This is a lot harder than it looks and it's also looks kind of funky, but, um, sorry, turn the volume off. Um, same concept. Now hips are holding still, sliding side to side, keeping those shoulders as level as possible, which I don't do all that well. I probably should have re-recorded it, but um, the idea that you can, you know, move your upper body independent from your pelvis. Again, all of this is applicable when we're riding complicated lateral movements or pirouettes or really even just sitting the trot on a circle. Okay. And then this one here starts to, next slide gets a little bit more into, <laughs> I look so angry, I'm sorry. Um, a little bit more into actually, you know, holding your body stable as, as there's movement happening. And so this is kind of like a intro to a plank. And they're also kind of fun. So you can go into a door jam or just a wall here. Feet go close to the wall, keeping those ribs down and back. And you just lean sideways. It's a pretty good arm workout too. Um, it's actually fun despite the grumpy look on my face. I tried to move my feet even further and I almost fell over. So it's harder than it looks. Um, but you obviously you do that in both directions and you maybe even could add a little twist with it. You know, you go down and then twist and then back up. Um, all these different movements are really good ways that our spine is often not moving. Um, so last one here, this is definitely the most challenging, but it would be pretty hard to, oh my gosh, sorry. It would be hard to do a talk on um, core, the functional core without talking about planks. Planks are not everyone's favorite, but they can be really fun. So um, the issue with planks is that a lot of people do them incorrectly and they'll be like, wow, I can hold a plank for three minutes, but they're doing it in ways that are activating all the wrong muscles. So my first attempt here, I show an incorrect plank. You can see those ribs are flared. Low back is really arched, showing my flaring ribs. I could sit here and hold this for five minutes and it would not do a dang thing to help my riding. So an improvement in the plank here, I'm gonna go up. I'm gonna drop those ribs down. Now it might look like my butt is more up. You know, a lot of times you hear, keep that butt down. And so you end up in that arched position. But if you, you know, the butt's maybe a little bit more up here, but those ribs are anchored down. The core is the correct length. It's not overarching, it's not overstretching. Now, where planks really get fun and really a lot more effective than just sitting there on the ground with nothing moving and not having to respond to anything is when you make them unstable. So if you use you know, a ball like this, you can go up on it, make sure those ribs are down, activating that core in the right way. Now move that ball around. This is much more applicable to riding your horse. Um, I'm just sort of doing random movements here, up and back, side to side, circles are really good. And that ball is not always moving exactly how you want it to. And so it's really good for dynamic stability. Um, you might not be able to hold it quite as long as a regular plank, but really good for that. You can stick it under the feet as well. Another way to add some instability. You'll see some people who are really good at these. It'll have their feet on one ball and hands on two different balls and it's crazy. But um, there's a lot of different things that, you know, if you take these concepts that we're talking about, you can apply it to just about, you know, any core exercise. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, one of these to be perfect, but it's really the concepts that, that apply. Um, okay, so those were all about keeping the core stable while you're moving. So now I want to start talking about generating movement from the core. So, you know, this is also applicable to riding. We're 
we use our core as quote part of our seat you know when you're pushing your horse to maybe go into an extended canner or something we have to generate power from our core um, even though it might look like we're holding perfectly still um, and so these next exercises are really things that help to generate the movement so this one this one's fun it's a lot harder than it looks i swear you'll see all the faces i'm making um so this is rolling over that's generated from the core. So you wanna keep your body as straight as you can, which <laughs> look on my face, you can tell it's kinda of hard. Um, the tendency is either to flip your leg over first or your arm over first, but really using the core to generate that twist. And you know, you can kinda of even see how this would apply to riding that um, my body isn't much. I'm still in a pretty straight line, theoretically I should be, um, but I'm having to generate power even without movement. And so that's, you know, you can see how that would apply. Um, that one's fun, it's kind of hard though. This next one feels really nice. This one's called rocking. Um, on top of being a good generator from the core, this one also adds in a bit of a round in the low back. So this helps to relax those muscles that we talked about that get overly tight because we stand in that overly arched position a lot of the time with the, the tight hip flexors and so, um, you want to kind of make the the distance between your lower ribs and your pelvis into kind of the shape of a rocking chair um again that's hard for me this is not my natural position but so you get in this position and then you just rock and you want it to really come more from the core than from the legs and then you start to turn in a circle so you can go all the way 360 sorry this is not the most attractive view of me but um you can start to add that little twist and that's really coming from the core. That's not, you can see a little bit of kick happening. It's kind of hard, but um, it not only is a good core exercise, but it also is helping to relax those little back muscles. It's kind of giving them a little massage if you're on a hard enough surface. Um, so this is a good one and it's a fun one and you look kind of funny, it's great. Um, this one's really, oh wait. Yeah, okay, this one's really fun. So not everyone's gonna have something that they can hang from. I have a pull-up bar in my house, but maybe there's a monkey bar at the park or a, um, I don't know, a tree or something. Um, hanging and swinging is actually a very natural human movement that we do almost never, um, unless you're a kid playing on the monkey bar. And so, but it actually is a very functional way to use your core where rather than, you know, your legs are stable and you're generating power from your core with your feet on the ground, now you're hanging from something and you have to generate power from your core with your arms overhead. So it's helping uh, disassociate those arms from those ribs. So really important when you're hanging, you wanna make sure that those ribs are anchored down and back, just like you would be if you were standing. Um, and then, you know, even just hanging is a pretty good workout, but then you can add in some swinging, which is really fun, <laughs> um, despite my grumpy face. Um, but you can swing front to back, you can swing side to side, and again, you're really generating power from your core, you're bringing those arms away from those ribs, and you're having to keep those ribs anchored down and back, even though there's an upward force pulling on them. So that one is just kind of fun. I had to add that in, because if you have the ability to do it, it's a good time. Okay, so next section here is gonna be talking about lengthening those hip flexors and those adductors that we mentioned at the beginning. Even though this is supposed to be about core, those are really, they all attach to the pelvis, they're all a part of the core. So um, that's what this next series is talking about is lengthening those muscles. So um, these, are, <laughs> these are not the most attractive videos you'll ever see. They're kind of funny positions, but um, bear with me. So this one is uh, it's gonna be three different stretches, the knee out, the leg out, and the frog stretch. So starting with the knee out, ideally you wanna keep the pelvis flat on the ground and you're just gonna bring the hip out to the side. Now it's kind of difficult to do sometimes. You can see my hip came off the ground a little bit. So if you need to, you can do two here without lifting the pelvis and then you can rock the pelvis to the opposite side to get the knee where you want it and then work towards flattening. So this is where you rock the hip, bring the knee up. Now work towards flattening that hip on the ground. Um, doing them one at a time like this really lets you kind of pinpoint where you might need to spend more time on one side than the other. Most people have a harder side. Now this is the leg out, essentially the same thing. It's just the leg goes out straight rather than bending the knee. Um, and these actually feel pretty nice. Again, put the hip out, lean down and stretch. There's a bunch of ways that you can stretch your adductors. This is just one that you can use gravity to help you um, where your spine is staying neutral. A lot of adductor stretches, like when you're um, 
when you're, you know, spreading your legs and bending forward from a seated position, the tendency is going to be to round the low back rather than really get the most stretch from the leg. So this is a nice way to keep that spine nice and neutral. And it also um, is lengthening the hip flexors at the same time, rather than bending forward like you would be if you were seated. Okay, and then this one is the frog stretch. It's <laughs> very funny. Sorry, I was using the camera as my, uh, my mirror, so I keep looking at the camera. But <laughs> you're, so you're going to go knees out, literally like a frog. And then you're going to sit back into that stretch. Now the key here being that you want to keep the normal arch in your low back. You don't want your pelvis to tilt back as you do this. So that was how you do want to do it. This is how you don't want to do it. You don't want to tilt that pelvis back and round the low back. You're really trying to target the adductors here, not the low back. And then you just hold that and hold it for a minute or so. So these are lengthening all those muscles that become over tight from sitting in the saddle for hours and hours and not counteracting it with other things. Um, another one of the hip flexors is your quad. So that's a really normal thing in you know a lot of people is to have tight quads. So um, quad stretch, I like to put a towel underneath the front of my pelvis there so my pelvis doesn't tip forward as I stretch out that quad. Um, People have, you know, various levels of flexible quads. If you're pretty flexible, you can take that knee off the ground as well. Again, holding that stretch for about a minute. And again, I'm sorry that these go really fast. It's probably kind of hard to follow along, but if you guys are interested, I can make this into more of a follow along type video and post the link to that. Um, so yeah, pretty basic quad stretch. Again, there's a bunch of different ways you can stretch your quad, but a quad is, it not only bends, um, extends the knee, but it also flexes the hips. So you want to make sure that you're not a, not neglecting the stretch of that. Now, lunge stretch, really awesome stretch issue, like the plank being that a lot of people do it wrong. Um, so I'm gonna show first here, this is an incorrect stretch. Lunging way forward, looks like I'm super freaking flexible and my legs are so far apart, but look at how curved my low back is, my ribs are flared. It's not really doing all that much to stre stretch my hip flexor because my pelvis is just tilting forward here, ra sorry, rather than actually stretching that part along the front of my leg. My pelvis just tips and arches that low back. So rather than that, I'm gonna do now proper lunge. My ribs stay down. I put, place my foot just right underneath my knee or maybe very slightly in front. My pelvis stays neutral. And I really think about pushing my, the glute of the back leg forward. And that way, if you guys are doing this right now and following along, you'll feel you get so much more stretch along the front of this hip flexor here and you're not putting extra strain on the low back by overarching it. So lunge stretch, really awesome. Just make sure that you're doing it right. It's probably my favorite of the hip flexor stretches um, as long as you're doing it right. And this is something that you, you can do this too, um, like even on a mounting block, you can put the front leg up on a surface and lean into it without putting the knee on the ground. So if you wanna do that you know, before you get on your horse or whatever, again, just make sure that your pelvis is staying neutral and you think about pushing the back glute forward for that stretch. Okay, so now, of course, we just talked about the stretching of the overtight muscles. Now we want to talk about strengthening and reactivating those glutes and the pelvic stabilizers that were turned off by the fact that those muscles were super tight. So this one's my personal favorite, single leg deadlifts. I was introduced to these as a runner because I have been a runner at points in my life. Um, they're really great for a lot of things. They work the back of the leg. So like, like I said, a lot of people tend to be quad dominant, front of the leg dominant. So this is a great activator for the glutes, the hamstrings. Um, it also really works the gluteus medius as a stabilizer because it's gonna be on a single leg. So starting here without weight, the goal is to keep the hips totally level. Now when I watch this back, I was not so good at that. That back leg, that back hip is starting to come up a little bit. So if you have the ability to do this in front of a mirror, definitely recommend it. Um, I do recommend starting with no weight. I've had friends who try to keep up with me when I've been doing these for years and put a lot of weight on and you can strain your hamstring pretty easily because it's having to activate with your hamstring in full extension. The other thing this is great for, it also stretches your hamstring without having to sit there doing hamstring stretch for forever. So the many reasons why I like this. If you would like to add weight, I like using a kettlebell, but you can use anything, a grocery bag for all I care, it doesn't matter. Um, if you do it double-handed, it gives you the most stability. If you want it to challenge those stabilizers even more, you can do it one-handed at a time. Um, it's easier if you're using the opposite hand from the stabilizing leg, but anyway, 
any way that you want to do this exercise, um, it's a really good one for activating the glutes that extend the leg. You know, sometimes you have to bring your leg back when you're riding and being able to extend the hip is a very good thing. Apparently I forgot to edit out the, uh, taking, <laughs> taking the video on and off on that one. Um, so then of course, when you're talking about glutes, you have to talk about squats. There's no avoiding that. Um, but I don't want to talk about squats as far as, you know, I'm sure some of you on here could probably squat a lot of weight on a barbell and that's awesome. That's great. I cannot. Um, but the squat is a very functional movement. It's a very natural movement and it's one that we don't do very often. So if you ever watch a baby squat, babies have like the perfect squat posture. <laughs> they can go butt to the floor, shoulders stay back knees stay behind the heel or behind the toes and it's really beautiful and great and we lose a lot of that not because we necessarily have to but because we don't do it very often so at the beginning here i'm going to show my squats are work in progress but um if you have a hard time squats you can put something raised behind your heel so i just have a rolled up towel here and then arms overhead, you should be able to keep the, the leg pretty straight up and down, come all the way down and back up. Now the average person can't really do that anymore due to some form of lack of mobility, whether it be ankle, which ankle is a big one and that's where the towel definitely helps, but knee, hip, thoracic spine, that upper back really should be able to um, stay pretty flat, which is the arms overhead, although you don't have to do arms overhead. Um, but there are different variations of the squat here. Um, you know, if you, if you can't go down that far, which I could not, if I didn't have the bolster behind me, you can go down just as low as, as you can while keeping those shin bones basically as vertical as possible. This is not great posture on my part. My upper body's coming a little too far forward, but I practiced them too much before I recorded. Um, and then even if that's too hard, you can add in a chair. So you can do, you know, chair sit to stands, but back. Notice here is where my shin is staying the most up and down because I know I'm not going to have to catch myself. But you get that glute activation. Um, those ribs really should be staying down and back. I did okay there. But um, all that core stuff, um, whether you know it or not, your core is working even when you're squatting. Um, so that's, you know, to help balance out the pelvis and um, all those, your pelvis really forms the base of your core. All your core muscles are attached to your pelvis. So um, working your legs is not just for the sake of working your legs, it really is working your core as well. So I think the last section here in my movements is strengthening your core with everyday movement. So it would be awesome if we all had this quarantine life and had hours to work out every day. Um, I know I don't, I know most people don't. So there are ways that you can be working on having a more functional core, doing things you're already doing every day. Don't need to set aside three hours every morning to get your work at it. Um, so starting with getting up and down off the floor often and in different ways. So, you know, we talked about sitting, we're all sitting a lot, even better than sitting with perfect mechanics is to sit in different ways, different positions, um, even positions that you might think, oh, you know, that's, that's not a good position to sit in. Like this one on the side here with the knees bent, a lot of people might think, oh, that's really hard on the knees. Well, maybe if you did it for hours on end, but your knees should have that much flexibility. That shouldn't really be an issue for a short term. You've got the you know, full ankle extension there. Um, sitting crisscross applesauce is really awesome. Opens up those hips. I wouldn't recommend doing it slouched over. Um, you know, try to sit up as straight as you can, but if you're watching TV, you know, sit on the ground. Um, get up in creative ways. You can get up as a lunge, as a squat, in this funny little way here. Um, all different ways of sitting and standing. Every time you're moving, your core is working. Your core is, you know, working every time you walk, every time you stand. So use that to your advantage when you're doing the things that you're already doing. Try to get creative in how you're moving around and sitting around, I guess. Um, carrying things. Again, that's something that we hear all the time. Oh, don't carry your kid. It's not, it's not good for you. Um, it's, it's hard on your back. It's, this is really activating the core. If you're carrying your kid off to the side here and you're trying to walk with good posture, keeping those ribs down and back, um, it's really going to be good for a functionally stable core. Now don't carry them on the same side all the time, move them around a little bit. Um, but you know, same thing with your groceries, maybe do a basket instead of a shopping cart. You got to be there anyway. So why not, you know, work out your core a little bit, get some dynamic stability. And as long as you're walking with good posture, don't, you know, hunch over and pick up your groceries with a bent over spine. But if you're walking with good mechanics, it's a great thing to carry. Pick out your horse's stall. 
you know, the, get, give the workers at the barn a little break every once in a while, carry your shavings bags, carry your grain bags. Um, the caveat to all of this is don't, you know, say, oh, Jamie said, go pick stuff up and go haul around grain bags all day long tomorrow. You're going to hurt and not be so happy with me. But if you're using good mechanics, build up to it slowly. Um, start doing things like carrying, um, pick up your dog, <laughs> you know, anything. It's a really, really easy way to work your core and you don't even feel like you're doing it. It's, you know, it's not like you're feeling like you're getting a workout. Um, another great thing, walking. Walking is super good for the core. It, um, every, you know, your legs and arms are moving at different, um, different directions. And so you've got a twist through the core. It's how you're generating power. If you, running is great too. If you ever run a long distance run, you'll probably note afterwards that your core is about as sore as your legs are. I did it, I don't recommend this, but I ran a half marathon without training once. Um, my core really hurt at the end. <laughs> so it really, you know, walking, running, all that, really good for the core. Um, that being said, the best way to walk is not gonna be down the side. Unlevel, um, more natural surfaces, dirt, sand, trainers out there. Um, really great if you can teach lessons walking around the arena, ideally not in your boots. Um, but yeah, walking more is great. Turn your horses out, walk around the turnout with your horses. Um, this isn't something you have to add an hour into your day. Like use walking when you're already going to get lunch, walk to lunch, or while you're waiting for your food, walk a lap around the block, or you know, when you're meeting a friend for coffee, take your coffee on the go, something. Um, anything really, any amount of walking is going to be, is going to be good for you. And really, you know, as you're doing it, you want to make sure that you're applying the same principles that we talked about when you're standing. So feet um, in line with those hip bones in front, you don't want to walk like you're walking on a tightrope. When you do, um, it's going to inactivate the muscles that are stabilizing the pelvis on the outside that we talked about, you know, those, um, those glute medius, you want to walk with your legs a little bit apart. Um, you want your toes to stay pointed straight ahead and then you want your hips level. So that's the picture on the left here. This is a good walking mechanic feet, you know, toes, well, toes are mostly straight ahead. Um, hips staying nice and level. What you don't want is this little, you know, catwalk walk here where you put this leg as a stance and that hip drops way down. You can see in the picture here, the little glute medius, um, is really activated when your hips stay level versus the drop down. It's completely lengthening that muscle. So that's going to be, you know, your what's causing you to maybe collapse in your hips when you're riding, when you're you know, trying to ride a half pass and your trainer says you're collapsing. Maybe you have a weak glute medius, go for a walk. Um, last thing on movement here, make movement fun. It doesn't need to be you know, a workout every day. It's great if you love working out, that's awesome. Like good for you, because I can't say I do. But um, there's find exercises you like. I try to incorporate exercises that are pretty easy and fun. You don't need much equipment for. I personally think the single leg deadlifts are fun. They're like, you can do it on an unstable surface, stand on a foam pad or do it in the sand or something and try not to fall over. Um, you might not agree with me. You might not think that's fun, but find something that you find fun. Walk your dog, play with your kids, go for a picnic, sit on the ground, swing on a tree, something. Um, movement is good. Think about how you're activating your core while you're moving and you are working your core. That's, I guess that's what I'll leave you on as far as that goes. Um, this is not a chiropractic talk by any means, but I just wanted to mention a little bit about, um, you know, I get the question, of course, why are you a chiropractor? And um, so I got into it, short answer. I saw how much it helped my riding. I was an athlete when I was young. I did, um, you know, two to three sports at a time. And I always kind of felt like, I was fighting my body when I was riding. You know, I always, like I said, I always twist left. That's my natural way of going. Um, we talked about a lot of different ways here that our body ends up imbalanced because of the way we live and the things that we do every day. So in a perfect world, I would love to say that there's no need for, or you know, a lot less people would need chiropractic. Um, but the reality is that, you know, the world we live in, we put a lot of stresses on our body. And so we end up with things that are maybe not aligned how we want to be. So like, you know, right now, if you're sitting on your chair and you shift your weight to your left seat bone, you feel that and you're like, oh, I'm sitting crooked. Okay, I can fix that. Um, but what happens when you have tight adductors from riding your horse or from whatever, and it pulls your pelvis out of alignment and then you're, you're sitting like that all the time. Well, like we talked about the neurological pathways that are used often are the ones that are reinforced. So the, you know, the spine and the muscles around it are getting constant feedback to your brain about where your body is in space and how it is functioning. 
um, you can recognize when you do it you know, on your own that you're sitting on your left seat bone. But if you're sitting like that all the time, now your body starts to think that that's normal. And so it's not telling you that you're sitting on your left seat bone. And then your trainer says, sit straight. And you're like, I am sitting straight. This is how I sit. And you're having to fight your body to try to sit really how you naturally should be sitting. And so chiropractic is, you know, one tool. I use it often <laughs> and to good effect um, to help kind of reset the body and and help to realign those things that maybe have been chronically out of place, or maybe you know you had a fall and it is acutely out of place and just needs to be realigned so that you're not constantly having to fight your body. And so you know I have a, a kind of fun um, balance of being a trainer and a chiropractor, where I get to work with my riding clients as a chiropractor as well, and um, see how that really affects their riding. So um, I have a mobile business. It's fun. I get to go to barns and see people. Um, get to watch them on their horse and all kinds of stuff. So it's a good time. All right. And then I just want to leave you with some recommendations of, you know, if you're bored right now and want some, some great reading, um, here are three different writing related books specifically. Um, Mary Wanless's Writer Biomechanics. I know, um, this is who Alexis has worked with a lot. She's amazing. This book is really awesome. Um, and I know Megan has worked with her quite a bit as well. She does different seminars, so can't recommend that one enough. Um, the Riding Doctor, as far as just really easy functional things, I um, all my a lot of my images were pulled from this book. It's a really great book. Highly recommend it. Um, this one I have paged through. Honestly, I have not written, read it cover to cover, but it's an older book. I think it was from 2003 by Betsy Steiner, um, Mind, Body, and Spirit: Progressive Training for Rider and Horse. It was a really good one as well. Um, and then some non-horse related ones that also are really applicable. Um, this is going to sound kind of weird. So these are all from the same author. Her name's Katie Bowman. She's a natural movement specialist. Um, she's a biomechanist. She's awesome. I love her stuff. Um, this middle book here, the Diastasis Recti, um, it's actually where most of, oops, sorry, most of the content from today came from, even though Diastasis Recti is actually a condition that's often seen in pregnancy. Um, but it's really just about a functional core. Um, so if you're interested in the stuff I talked about today, I tore through this book in one day. It's not a hard read. I think the um, ebook is like $7 on her website right now, which is nutritiousmovement.com. Um, so that's a really good one, very easy to digest, and it goes a little bit more into the stuff I talked about today. Her longest book, Move Your DNA, also really excellent stuff in there about you know, just the way humans are meant to naturally move. Alignment Matters is kind of a fun one. It's a collection of all of her blog posts over the years. Um, and then last two, if you like the science side of stuff. Oh, come back. No, come back. Ah. Okay, well, I guess I'll just tell you. Um, oh, gosh. Sorry. Why is the main current story? There we go. Um, <laughs> the Reality Check is a book about chiropractic. If you're interested in the neurological side of it, um, Dr. Heidi Havoc is a chiropractor as well as a PhD in neuro physiology, I think, some neuro-related um, PhD. She's brilliant. So that's, it's another one that's really easy to read, but kind of fun on chiropractic. And then Anatomy Trains, this one is um, actually, he wrote the foreword for Mary Wanless's book. Um, he talks about like myofascial trains. And if you're a science nerd like I am, this book is really awesome. Um, so that's all I've got. Does anyone have any questions? Oh yeah, the zero drop shoes you had in that slide again. Yes, absolutely. If you need be happy to. Um, so this particular brand that I like is called Lens. Um, I like them because I think they're more attractive than other ones, <laughs> not because they're like highly superior or anything. They're also not as expensive. Um, Vivo Barefoot is one of the big ones and they tend, they are pretty nice looking, but they tend to be really expensive. So um, I found this brand, it's based out of Colorado. I ordered my boots a week ago and I got them in like three days, which during COVID times I thought was pretty good. Um, but yeah, there's a ton of different options the, of the zero, zero drop ones. Um, and then here's where some of the other decent options were the Ariots, the New Balances, and the Nike Free Runs. But um, yeah, those are Lems, L-E-M-S um, from Colorado. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Peony. Does anyone else have any questions? Nope, you got it. <laughs> Interesting slides to leave it on here. Um, okay, 
let's see, two questions at once. When I post the trap, my Laura like tends to windshield wiper. Any ideas what tightness may cause this? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, let's see. So like the lower leg kind of wants to swing back and forth is my guess. Um, so yeah. Okay. So I would say that um, this is probably something coming from the pelvis. Um, I'm trying to think of, you know, the, the motion of the trot as the um, as you're coming up, so really into hip extension, you're losing some control of your leg. So I would say kind of all the leg exercises that we talked about, or really anything that's going to be stretching the hip flexors, strengthening the pelvic stabilizer. So a lot of like, you know, single leg stance, standing on unstable surfaces. Um, those are all going to be really good things to stabilize the pelvis as you're going into hip extension. Again, everything on a horse is really dynamic. We're moving we're standing on a tiny little iron stirrup and we're trying to keep our legs still while moving forward on an animal. Um, so I would say more so than tightness for you, my guess would be more pelvic stability. So I would do a lot of like single leg stance, um, even working on your feet, you know, like doing a lot of stuff barefoot um, because even though, you know, you're in a boot in a stirrup, you're still standing on your foot. And so you wanna have pretty good feet stability because especially in posting trot, more so than um, other trots where you might be sitting, you are having to kind of balance on your feet a little bit. Um, so yeah, that would be my feedback on that one. How do I feel about dance coat clogs? Um, you know, I'll be honest, I haven't, I, last time I wore them, I almost broke my ankle. <laughs> uh, just, I'm not very coordinated. I roll my ankles a lot. Um, so I, don't wear them much just for that sake. I think they are relatively flat, um, if I remember correctly. I honestly haven't seen them in a while, so that question surprises me a little. Um, but I mean, that's great. They're nice looking shoes. I just, <laughs> just personally haven't seen them in a while. Um, I would say as far as the drop, they're probably totally fine. Just make sure that you have pretty good ankle stability, because if I remember correctly, rolling your ankle in those bad boys is not a good time. Um, but yeah, if they're flat, the only, th okay, here's the one bad thing I would say about them. They're very stiff sold. Um, so if you look at like on the screen here, the, um, all of these shoes, even the, well, the Aria, it's not so much, but these ones have a very flexible, bendable sole. And so you're working out your feet and I didn't get, I could do an entire lecture on feet. They're fascinating, but, um, your feet actually have a lot of muscular and fascial connections to your pelvic floor. And so when you're not using the, all the muscles in your feet you're not doing um like you know the foot motion of really extending your toes and pushing off the ball of your foot like you would not be able to do in a boot or a clog um you're not activating all those muscles that go all the way up to the core and you're not doing yourself any favors in that way um that being said i know that you know i don't i can't really recommend wearing a minimalist shoe around a horse if you get your toes stepped on it's not gonna feel good so um, I think they're, they're better than, you know, wearing a heel boot. So um, that answered that question. And then as a person with high arches, a lot of minimalist zero drop shoes have minimal arch support. Should I be using a more higher arch support? I knew this question was going to come up. I almost, almost did a slide on it if I knew it was going to come up, but I thought it'd be better if someone asked. So um, if you're willing, okay, here's the, this is a, a kind of answer. If you're willing to do the work on your foot, um, it is great to work on your arches on their own without having to use a, um, without having to use an orthotic. So I usually get this question in reverse that people have flat feet. So high arches, kind of their own animal, um, in part because high arches usually mean you have sort of a lack of, lack of flexibility in your foot. And so, um, it's kind of different, different work than someone with a flat foot. Someone with a flat foot should be doing, you know, a lot of that um, hip rotation kind of stuff, really working on developing the strength in the foot. You kind of have an over taut foot with a high arch. And so if you, if you have the time to spend to really work on foot flexibility, um, which I am not an expert in, I, I will say Katie Bowman has a whole book on it. Um, but you know, doing a lot of work with a ball on the sole of your foot, um, trying to get some work using toe stretchers, trying to just get that arch to work a little bit more. That is a best case scenario. The foot is supposed to work like a spring. Your body in theory has everything it needs for your foot to work properly. Now that being said, um, I realize that most people don't have time to sit there working on their foot for hours a day. And so it is better to use an arch support, whether you have too high or too low of an arch, um, than to walk around with 
horrible foot form all the time. You're going to end up with foot pain, back pain, the whole lot. So if you don't, and I'm by no means saying you're lazy if you don't have time, I know what it's like to be super busy. Um, if you don't have time, you don't have the desire to put in the extra work that might be needed, then yeah, absolutely. You probably want to use an arch. It's a lot better than having bad foot mechanics all the time. Um, if you do have the interest in, you know, doing the minimalist shoes, or zero drop shoes or whatever, um, work into it slowly. Don't go, you know, from zero to 60 on the <laughs> minimalist shoes because your feet, like anything, will be sore. Um, so yeah, maybe something to start playing with and you could put an arch support in a more flexible shoe to like a, you know, minimalist shoe so that you're getting the benefit of the, like you said, putting arch support in the minimalist shoe. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, hope that was helpful. Okay. Um, do you have any tips for keeping hips even? I have a tendency to let my right hip drop into the horse's back and left hip gets stuck and lacks normal mobility. Um, <laughs> chiropractic. Yay. Um, <laughs> you're welcome, Clara. Um, yeah, chiropractic for sure would probably be helpful for you. But um, that being said, um, I would say really, really learning your body as far as, you know, working on these stretches that we went through. There are so many other stretches out there. We would be here all night if I tried to tell you every stretch for, for hips and everything else. Um, and so not just doing them, but really paying attention to how you're doing them and which one feels tight. And if you have one that feels tight, spending some more time on that side, not just stretching, but moving dynamically. So there's like all kinds of like hip swings. Um, there's ways, there's like stretches on the ground where you kind of have your, your knees bent to one side and then you roll over so they bend to the other side. Um, butterfly stretch is one that you could, you probably know what it is already. You could easily Google. Um, really, you know, pinpointing where you're tight and spending some extra time. Um, another thing that you can do, and I was going to mention it during this presentation, um, get a lacrosse ball or even a tennis ball, but lacrosse ball works pretty, is probably the best. Um, and you can use it to do some manual therapy. So like using it on your hip flexor or even your lateral hip in your glutes, you can lie on it on the ground and kind of move around on it. Um, that's a really good way to break up some of the adhesion. Like, you know, it's, it's like giving yourself a massage, um, that, you know, on the, you said, let's see, your right hip drops. Um, is that better than foam rollers are awesome too. Um, and that's another thing that oh, I can't believe I didn't mention that. Um, see, I just teach myself as I go. Um, you can roll, lie on a foam roller is another really great way for upper, upper back stuff, whole back stuff, where you just put it from your head to your tailbone and just lie on it, let your chest open up. Um, foam roller, really awesome for, for glute stuff as well. Um, sometimes it can be a little tough when you're talking hip, like, so when I'm thinking hip, I'm thinking like, um, the front of your pelvis, you know, like where your hip flexors are, it's kind of hard to get a foam roller in there. Um, the ball can be a little easier and a little bit more pinpoint. So you can really kind of lie on a trigger point, um, a super effective way to do that. Take the ball, lie on it in a spot that is kind of tender, feels really tight and just literally lie in that same spot for like five minutes and really just focus on, it's like a, you know, a yoga technique, just allowing that tension to leave that muscle. Um, sounds kind of crazy, but it really will help it relax and get some more mobility there. Um, and you said your left hip, sorry, is the one that lacks mobility, but, um, yeah, all that stuff, just, just really getting to know your body and spending some time off of the horse. Um, it should make a really big difference when you're on the horse, just being able to move it that much. Um, hopefully that's helpful. Also, you know, if you do have... <laughs> I sort of jokingly said chiropractic, but if you do have a chance to get checked by a chiropractor or, you know, even a massage therapist is not the same, but, you know, similar concepts, um, it really can make a difference. A lot of times people think, oh, you know, I'm just so stiff on the side and then I'll look at their pelvis and I'm like, oh yeah, like your pelvis literally is out of alignment on that side. You couldn't physically move it there if you had to. Um, for example, I had one, she was, I don't know, an 18 year old patient. She's like, oh, my toe turns out so bad on the side. I can't keep my, my toe pointed forward. And I check her pelvis. It's like completely rotated in on that side, which is going to make the hip rotate out. And like one adjustment done, she was like so much better. Um, and actually was ended up the other side was harder. So, um, it really can help. It's helpful to have, uh, helpful. And I've had done PT on, on and off to get those muscles retain. Awesome. Yeah. PT. Great. I actually, I'm um, working towards a master's in sports med right now. So I'm doing an internship at a PT office when we're not in COVID times and I'm 
some really cool stuff from, from that as well. So that's great. Awesome. And see anything else? Nope. All right. Well, thank you guys for listening to me ramble on. Um, if anyone wants to connect with me on Facebook, feel free. Um, it's Jamie Pastana. Um, and what else? Oh, if you ever want to email me, um, my business email is jamie at elitecairobayarea.com. Um, come say hi when we have four shows again, hopefully at some point in the near future. Um, I will be there in Northern California. So thank you guys all. Really appreciate it. It was nice to sort of meet you all. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much, Jamie. That was wonderful. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for putting this together. Yeah, no problem. Um, this is great. And so, yeah, for everyone who's here, um, I'm going to have the recording up probably by the end of the, well, definitely by the end of the weekend. It usually takes me two days. Um, and so then you can watch it again and hopefully we can get some more people um, watching via YouTube. I've already heard from a bunch of people who couldn't make it who are really excited. So, awesome. great. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you later. <laughs>